Welcome to the webinar hosted in association with Leading Edge Alliance, along with Sunil Gwen Associates, founder members of BLEA from New Delhi in India. Uh, at the outset, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all participants who are attending this webinar from different parts of the, of the world. Uh, just to make sure that all of you can see the screen and hear me loud and clear, if you can please drop a few messages on the chat screen, which you should be able to see on the left of your screen, I'd really appreciate that. Okay, great. Uh, since I've received a confirmation for a few of you, I would assume that all of us would be able to see as well. Uh, at the outset, just to give a quick introduction, my name is Sohail Goyal. I'm a qualified chartered accountant from India as well as a CPA from the US. I am managing the practice of Associates, which are founding members of the LEA from New Delhi and have offices in Bombay as well as a few other cities of the, of the country. Uh, just to walk you through the presentation today and what we wish to kind of cover through this presentation, which will probably be about one hour. Uh, India has obviously been one of the most attractive opportunities for businesses to expand their foothold in the world. India has seen a lot of growth in terms of the consumption, in terms of the economy, yet there are a lot of challenges which are noticed when businesses are looking to expand their operations into India or at the same point of time when they're looking to transact with India. This presentation is obviously going to be not sufficient to cover all aspects, but this would broadly be an overview of the kind of compliances that would be applicable and few things just to highlight whenever you're looking to transact with India and a few recent things which have caught the world attention in terms of the developments in the country and key initiatives which have been taken by the new government which has come into the country in the last couple of years. After the huge paral policy paralysis which was plaguing the country over the last decade or so. Uh, just to kind of repeat, uh, the broad agenda would be to discuss the Indian economy, uh, overview the key laws, policies, which are trying to catalyze the whole process of doing business in India and few of the key initiators of the government. We'd be going through a quick introduction of the highlights of the country. Uh, thereafter, trying to run you through what are the key ways to set up your business in India. Uh, mind you, this will be only a very high level overview of the kind of opportunities and the routes for investment into India. Specifics, uh, time permitting, we may not be able to get into. Thereafter, a few of the compliance and regulatory obligations which are applicable in the country would be discussed again at a pretty high level. And then uh, the key taxes which would be applicable to entities which are looking to do business in India. This discussion would be restricted from the perspective of foreign companies which are transacting within India or possibly have businesses which have been set up in the country. We try and cover the key direct and indirect taxes which are applicable and the new goods and service tax, which is uh, in the horizon for the country and should be in place tentatively by the 1st of July 2017, as informed by the finance minister of the country very, very recently. Uh, the last bit would be uh, some of the key changes, some of the news making articles, which have been the highlights in the world news across the, the globe. Demonetization, which one of the, the hottest debated topics in the in the world from the India's perspective. And then finally, in case we do have some time, we'll try and touch upon some of the key case studies or the success stories and failures, which we've noticed for foreign companies who have set up business in big ways, and some of the key learnings that you might want to get out of that. Uh, 8th November 2016 was uh, quite a decisive day for not just the Indian but the American as well as the world economy as a whole. There was a huge transitional change in the government in the US 
coupled with the demonetization impact in India, which has been a paradigm shift towards a completely different way of doing businesses in India. And then the key impacts of these decisions, which have been felt and will continue to be felt across the world in the years to come. And then obviously with the Brexit, and as it turns out, the key way in which the government would pan out the Brexit, a lot of these things which were discussed and which will continue to be debated in the years to come originated out of this day of the 8th of November 2016. Just to give an overview of India as an investment destination, the key, the new dispensation which has taken over from the year 2014 has taken a new slew of measures which have been easing the governing and the fundraising norms. There have been a lot of clarification which have been issued by the government to address a few of the concerns which had been raised by foreign institutional investors into the country as well as large businesses which were looking to set up. It has sent a very good signal to the world as a whole and yet campaigns like Make in India which has been a pet project of the new prime minister of the country that has helped to generate a lot of business into the country. Uh, there has been a significant growth in terms of the GDP till very very recently India was poised to be the fastest growing economy in the world. There have been some uh, reductions in the key estimates of growth for the country but by and large, India continues to be one of the fastest growing economies of the world. Uh, the foreign direct investment which India has been receiving in the recent past has been growing quite exponentially. During the period April to September of 2016, the FDI inflow into the country was about 21.6 billion US dollars, which is about a 30% year on year increase from the previous period. This should give you an idea of the confidence which the world continues to have in Indian, India story, in spite of the few challenges which are there in the country still. Uh, key services uh, which have been able to generate this about 5.2 billion foreign investment into the country. Uh, telecommunication has been the next most attractive destination, followed by general trading, both multi-brand, single brand, etc and most recently the total equity inflows for the month of september was about 5.15 billion which again is a number which continues to inspire the confidence into the country for various destinations where money is being invested to give you an overview of the most attractive sources from where the fdi is generated into the country mauritius continues to be the most favorable destination in view of the double taxation avoidance agreement which India continues to have with Mauritius. Singapore being one of the, the next best alternative followed by Japan and the US. These countries as a whole are generating huge amounts of money flowing into the country both for key strategic reasons as well as for the reasons of having attractive double taxation treaties with the country. Uh, there have been estimates of growth of 20 to 25 percent CAGR um, in, in, in the year 20 to 25. US dollars, uh, 6 to 8 billion is, is the estimate from, from that period. And again, India story is something which continues to be one of the most attractive uh, success stories of the world. Uh, in this background, uh, it is very essential for you to appreciate what is the correct way to set up a business in India and how you should be transacting with the country. There are various ways in which you can set up your business in India. The key routes of investment for any non-resident entity into India would be fourfold. The most obvious and the most commonly used route would be the foreign direct investment. We will discuss this in a little more detail in the next few slides. You could also invest as a foreign institutional investor, which is an FII. You could also look at the route of investment as a foreign venture capital investor or the FVCI investment route, or else you could continue to invest as a holder of ADRs and GDRs. Uh, 
Uh, in this discussion, we will restrict ourselves to FDI just for the sake of uh, the time that we have available to us. We would be separately happy to address any queries on any of the other routes of investment. Foreign investors which are looking to set up business in India originally nor were assumed to be requiring government permissions. However, with the Indian economy opening its doors in the year 1991, India is now by and large a country which requires minimal governance in terms of a majority of the sectors. There are still sec some key sectors which require a prior government approval, but by and large, the country is moving towards an open door policy and is attracting a lot of investment under the automatic route. As I mentioned, the automatic route of foreign direct investment is something which the government has eased its control over. There are certain sectoral caps which have been defined under the automatic route. And as long as you follow within the sectoral caps, you only require to intimate your foreign investment within 30 days and thereafter file certain regulatory forms with the Reserve Bank of India after 30, rather within 30 days of issuance of shares to the foreign investors. Uh, just to give an idea of the sectoral caps which are applicable, this is a very limited uh, overview of the industries. We've not covered all, but by and large, these are a few of the key areas in which investment is permitted up to 100% up to 59, 49, and various other limits which are prescribed. Uh, industries which do not have a clear sectoral cap or which are not clearly mentioned, they do fall under a residuary clause wherein all other industries would be allowed to have an automatic route. Yet there are some key areas in which investment is either restricted or is a multi-pronged approval which is required from the government. Uh, these are the areas in which foreign direct investment is not permitted under the automatic route. These are some of the key areas in which either the security of the country is into question or these are certain areas where the government continues to hold some sort of control over and would not permit this under the automatic route. Yet in, in our recent experience, we've seen that the government is fairly open to granting approvals as long as the conditions are being fulfilled within the parameters set by the government. Uh, under the approval route, FDI uh, is covered and is required to be applied for before the Foreign Investment Promotion Board, which is the FIPB. Uh, you need to submit proposals clearly mentioning what kind of investment you would be making in the country, who, if at all, would be the local partners of your businesses in India. And based on the recommendations of the FIPB, an approval is granted to your organization for setting up an entity under the approval route. Now, moving on to the kinds of entities which could be created under the foreign direct investment, uh, proprietorship, which is normally not the the most ideal structure. Uh, very recently, there have been guidelines to simplify the foreign direct investment norms under a partnership, which would include LLPs as well. The most commonly operated structures are a private limited or a limited company under the Indian Companies Act, which could either would be a wholly owned subsidiary of the foreign company, or it could be a joint venture with an Indian partner. Uh, you could also look at opening up a branch office or a liaison office or a project office, which would also be an entity registered in India under the local laws, yet the foreign shareholders continue to have control over such an entity. Uh, this is a very quick overview of the kind of structures which are available as we discussed in the initial slide. The first one being a corporate entity, which would mean a private limited or a public limited entity, a liaison office under which no commercial activities are allowed, while a project office is normally preferred by entities which have a temporary side office for specific projects. 
and then finally a branch office under which commercial activities are allowed yet the entity con continues to be a foreign company the tax rates for an indian corporate are in the range of about 30 percent while for a project and branch office they are 40 percent besides any applicable surcharges or cesses uh, again it is very important to understand the kind of activity which would be carried out in india to determine which entity you should be operating under and also to determine what kind of tax liability would accrue in india owing to the operations control wise uh, the parent company has control in the, la in the later three options while the indian board of directors would continue to have control for an indian company Uh, India has again, as we mentioned, has simplified the process of setting up the company. Initially, we did come across cases where it took a fairly long time because of various compliance hurdles. Very recently, there has been a consolidated simple form, as which is called the SPICE form, which is a consolidated form to set up the company. It is virtually a one-stop window through which the entire private limited company can be set up. Uh, it does not require multiple level of filings which were required in the past and this one consolidated form allows various subsequent registrations to also be filed in addition to the basic companies act registration for the company uh, moving to now some of the specifics of how to do business in india uh, it is very important to understand that India is a federal republic. Uh, India has a federal republic structure under which there is a clear distinction of powers which have been granted to the central government and the state government. Um, I believe uh, there is some issue and you're not at the right slide. If you can please allow me one second to check why the slides have not moved on to your screen. Uh, my apologies, if, if anyone could just type out what slide they can see, is this the 21 slide which is, which is visible on your screen? Yes, perfect, thank you. Uh, one of my colleagues mentioned that it was not working, but anyway, thank you. Uh, so just to go ahead with what I was describing under the federal structure, the central government has control over various uh, taxes and other related laws like income tax, service tax, custom duty, central excise, and uh, sales tax there is uh, also a local levy of a sales tax which is the vat which is under the state government there are other bits of stamp duty state excise laws land revenue records entertainment taxes and taxes on professions etc which is under the state government and yet there are some local bodies which have jurisdiction on property things of uh, local taxes in markets etc uh, this is very important to understand because when you're operating in India, a lot of times it is essential to choose under what state you should set up your business. There are different tax laws which are applicable in states and therefore it is advisable to seek prior professional advice on what state is suitable for the kind of operations in view of the differing taxes that you might have. Yet, till the time the GST is not made applicable in india it is also essential to understand the cross-border taxation of supply of goods between two different states there is a destined or rather an origin based tax as of today while when we discuss the gst regime in future it becomes a destination based tax uh, Moving on to the compliance side of the obligations, uh, whether you're a private or a public company, there are a number of compliances which you need to follow when you're setting up a business in, in the country. Uh, these are fairly routine compliances, which would be uh, pretty much the same across the world. 
you would need to get your accounts regularly audited. You would need to have regular shareholders at board meetings, annual corporate filings, filing of income tax returns, and other specific returns, which would be applicable under different state and central laws. Yet there would be some basic compliances which would need to be done by you at the beginning of the entity's life. Uh, there are various labor and employment regulations which are applicable in the country. These are again differing at times between state to state and it is essential to understand the state-wise obligations of these labor laws. Uh, under the foreign exchange laws, the Foreign Exchange Management Act is the primary act which governs the applicability of all cross-border transactions. There is the custom laws which will determine what taxes would be applicable when you're importing goods into the country. You would need to seek various permissions like an import-export court when you're starting off your cross-border transactions. Yet, there might even be local levies which would be attracted when there is a transfer of goods in the course of sale or rather in the course of import into the country. There are certain other laws which are towards protection of the foreign exchange to prevent any sort of money laundering or to prevent uh, transactions which do not have a proper motive. Uh, India has also had a fairly extensive competition uh, law which has evolved in the last few years. There is a clear demarcated law which governs all sorts of transactions which are anti-competitive in nature. There are proper authorities which are determining this and this is one of the key areas which is causing a lot of concern for both domestic as well as international companies when they're expanding their operations and facing hurdles in the country. Uh, there are clear environmental and consumer legislations which you should also be aware of. There are state-specific Factories Act as well as manufacturing obligations which you need to be aware of. Again, in the interest of time, we may not have specifics to discuss, but when you're setting up a business in the country, it is essential to understand what would be the location and what kind of environmental and consumer laws would be applicable to the respective business. Uh, moving on to the, the taxes which are applicable in the country, there are obviously both direct and indirect taxes which would be applicable. The direct taxes would be applicable on the direct earning of an income or rather on the recipient of the income while indirect taxes like anywhere else in the world would be through the beneficiary of the service or the goods which are being supplied. Uh, the corporation tax rate in India is normally 30% for domestic companies and 40% for foreign companies. There are certain exceptions which would be there, which can be discussed in case-to-case -case basis. This rate is besides an applicable surcharge and cess, which comes in if your income exceeds certain thresholds. There are special exemptions from taxes which are given by the government to various special export promotion zones to startups in order to promote their business, as well as industries which have been set up in certain notified areas. The Indian uh, the finance minister in its budget speed a couple of years back was commitment given to the country that he would reduce the 30% currently applicable corporation tax rate to 25% in a phased and staged manner by reducing a few of the special exemptions and certain uh, special benefits which have been given under different sectors. Uh, besides, when you're looking to distribute any dividends, there would be a dividend distributions tax. Uh, this is just a very quick example of what would be an effective tax rate. Currently, this rate would work out to be 20.35% whenever any dividend distribution tax is given out. This is besides, obviously, any other withholding tax obligations which might be there, normally in cases of dividend distribution tax being given out by Indian private limited companies, uh, there is no subsequent withholding tax which is required. However, this needs to be verified in case-to-case -case basis. Uh, there is also a minimum alternate tax which is applicable to operates whenever there is a, a tax liability which is less than 18.5% of its book profit.
there is a procedure to carry forward such minimum alternate tax in future when it can be set off against regular income. Uh, these are just some examples. Uh, there are obviously a few more iterations to the kind of tax rates which are applicable, but by and large, this would be the rates of taxation for long-term and short-term transactions in equity as well as debt instruments in the country, as well as certain other interest income and uh, government bonds that the uh, company might be earning out of. Uh, again, just like anywhere else in the world, there is a tax withheld at source. It is loosely called a TDS in India, a tax deduction at source. Uh, whenever there is a transaction both within the country as well as between India and the rest of the world, you first need to determine whether there is a chargeability of tax under the income India under the Indian Income Tax Act and thereafter determine at what rate you would need to deduct this tax. Whenever uh, any foreign company is claiming benefits under the Double Taxation Avoidance Agreement, it is a mandatory requirement to submit the tax residency certificates to the Indian entity which is proposed to withhold the tax. Uh, foreign tax credit, uh, just like anywhere else also in the world, there are different methods of claiming the foreign tax credit in India. Either you can get, uh, the, the country has allowed a unilateral tax relief, which means as in terms of Section 91 of the Income Tax Act, the Indian income tax authorities would themselves allow a double taxation relief with those countries in which India does not have a double taxation avoidance agreement while in other cases where there is a proper DTAA, uh, Article 23, which is normally the clause applicable read together with the domestic income tax provisions, would grant uh, bilateral tax relief. Uh, under most circumstances, a DTA relief would generally be more beneficial than the domestic tax laws. Uh, normally, an Indian authority would not override the DTAA provisions. However, in the later part of our discussion, we will touch upon something known as GAR, the general anti avoidance rules, which are also on the horizon and might potentially allow the Indian government to override double taxation avoidance agreements with different countries. Uh, under the bilateral tax relief, Article 23, besides which there are different articles with different countries, there is uh, either the exemption method of giving a bilateral tax relief or a credit method the direct the credit method could either be a direct indirect which would mean underlying tax credit which is applicable with countries like um, with singapore uh, great britain etc while there could also be a special credit or a tax powering arrangement with the respective treaty provisions uh, just moving on to what i was mentioning earlier the background of these general anti-avoidance rules which are in the horizon was the much debated Vodafone tax issue, which was in the headlines for a number of years and caused a lot of anxiety. The Indian authorities were of a belief that this whole arrangement was structured with a view to claim certain benefits which they should not have otherwise believed to have gotten. Uh, in this background, the general anti avoidance rules were formulated. Uh, the general anti-avoidance rules allow the Indian tax official to deny tax benefits if they are of the belief that a deal is without any commercial purpose other than tax avoidance. It also allows tax official to target participatory notes. Under GAR, the investor has to prove that the participatory note was not set out to avoid taxes. However, there is a very strong possibility that the government might defer the application of GAR from 1st of April 2017 to the future. Uh, the Indian Union budget is expected to be announced on the 1st of February and this is one of the most keenly awaited legislation and to see whether this will actually come into force. Uh, moving on to the indirect tax structure, um, as we were discussing the initial part, uh, there is a VAT on the goods, uh, there is a service tax on the services which are being performed, there is an excise tax on the manufacturing and a custom on cross-border transaction of goods. In India, at the moment, we do not have a unified goods and service tax. That's something which is likely to come up very soon. However, at this moment, for any transactions which are being taken, 
you do need to follow independent provisions of VAT, which are state specific, while the service tax is administered by the central government and is by and large the same across the country. Uh, we would obviously not have the time to go into specifics of each of these items, but a few of the key things which we believe are applicable and is required to be aware for businesses or for clients of yours who might be transacting with India. One of the most recent changes has been by the Ministry of Finance, which has amended the service tax rules relating to certain services which are called the online information and database access or retrieval services loosely termed as the OIDAR services. Any business which has been incorporated outside India, which provides such services to non-business entities in India, which by and large would mean a B2C transaction, this transaction would require the overseas entity to be registered in India and to pay a service tax on such a transaction. This was primarily brought about by the government to have a level playing field for both domestic as well as for international service providers. The Indian service providers were unfairly uh, treated in their sort of uh, representation before the authorities. They felt that their provision of service was more expensive than overseas providers because in the past overseas providers to B2C segment did not require to pay any service tax. Uh, this is a, a quick overview and a, an assessment of whether a service tax liability would arise. If you can see when the service provider is located outside the country, which means uh, the foreign OIEDR provider, whether the service recipient is a government or individual, then service tax would be applicable and the person and rather the foreign company would require to get itself registered in India. While in a B2B transaction, the liability continues to be on the Indian service recipient, while for various other transactions which have been noted under clause three and four, the liabilities have been mentioned herein. Uh, this is something which is very essential for all companies which are providing electronically uh, provided such services to businesses in India. It makes it essential for them to understand these provisions and also to comply with them. These have been brought about in effect from 1st of December 2016. Uh, the central government has made one of the few relaxations very recently where instead of having to set up a bank account in India, there are some notified foreign bank accounts which can be used by the foreign companies to pay the service tax in India and therefore it saves them through a lot of compliance burden of setting up a bank account in India or to engage the services of a local agent. Uh, there is another uh, levy which we believe that would be knowledgeable for companies which are transacting with India. Although this is not an obligation for the foreign company, but this is also something which Indian companies are now required to do with effect from 1st of June 2016. This is sort of a level playing field which the government wanted to bring about for companies in India who were getting certain defined services from overseas entities which did not have a permanent establishment in India. Uh, the uh, provision of digital advertising space, online advertisement or various other services which may be notified if in such services are being received by an Indian entity from overseas, they are obliged to pay the equalization levy of 6% as we discussed in the earlier slide. Uh, just to give some flavor of the litigation side, there is a very, very well-defined litigational structure in India. There are appropriate forums which can allow you to seek advanced rulings before entering into any transactions with India. There are also advanced pricing arrangements which can be reviewed when there are any transfer pricing matters in India for which specific guidelines are to be sought for by the foreign company looking to do the respective business in India. The advance ruling can be taken under various circumstances and would give a clear determination of the tax position which a transaction might have in India. 
uh, there is a direct tax authority for advanced rulings as well as a indirect tax advanced ruling authority. This gives a clear binding ruling in terms of various direct and indirect tax matters concerning a foreign investment venture in India. Uh, moving on to one of the most keenly awaited uh, regulation changes in India, this will pop in the country since the income tax and since the uh, uh, independence was achieved by the country way back in the 1947. The goods and service tax will combine the separate VAT and service tax which are applicable in the country, besides also subsuming a large number of different taxes to have a much simplified and a much more easier regulatory regime without the worry for a large, large number of foreign companies of different regulations to comply depending on different states and also different forms and filings which are to be done different uh, states of the country. Uh, these are just some of the taxes which would be subsumed under the GST. The GST would be administered both by the central government as well as the state government. There will be something called as the CGST, which is the central GST, and the SGST. Under the central G GST, there would be the excise duties, the service tax, various other additional and special duties of custom and several central cesses and surcharges would be subsumed under CGST, while under the SGST, the state-specific VAT, the central sales tax, the entry tax and optroy, entertainment taxes, the purchase tax and the luxury tax, as well as certain taxes on lottery, betting, gambling activities, and cesses and surcharges on goods and services would be subsumed. So this would just give you an indication of the number of taxes which would be brought within the purview of GST. It allows much simplified regime in future. Uh, some of the key advantages which we believe will accrue to businesses would be to have a unified market. There would be a seamless movement of goods, reducing the transaction cost. Consequently, the logistics cost would now be much lower in the past, companies were required to have multiple uh, logistics centers set across in different parts of the country simply because of the differing tax which were applicable on such transactions in different states of the country. Reduction in logistical cost will obviously lower the inventory and the working capital needs and therefore in the long run help the asset utilization and increase efficiencies of businesses. Uh, it would obviously make life a lot simpler for foreign companies which might anyway be struggling to comprehend the different regulatory environment and the laws in the country. A common GSE would give the correct message to the global economy in terms of the ease of doing business in India. This is still a topic which is under keen amount of debate and discussions between the central and state government. But based on the most recent estimates by the finance ministry, it is likely that this GST would be implemented countrywide from the 1st of July, 2017. Uh, moving on to one of the most hotly debated and publicized topics across the world. Uh, India was perennially plagued by the parallel economy syndrome. Uh, there were a lot of concerns about the quality of the regulatory environment which permitted the parallel economy to function. The Indian Prime Minister came into power with a huge promise to do away with the so-called black money in the country. The step which was taken by the government on the 8th of November 2016 was to demonetize all 501,000 rupee notes from the currency. What it by and large meant was if you had any notes of 500,000 rupees, they were no longer legal tender. You were granted a time up to the 30th of December 2016 to deposit all such notes with the respective bank authorities. And you could continue to withdraw them in future, although these limits of withdrawal were restricted. The objective of the government was multi-pronged. One of the approaches or the needs was to have a 
dissipate of the uh, black money or the so-called black money. They were on the assumption that a lot of people might not actually go ahead and deposit the money into the bank. Also, India has been plagued with a lot of counterfeit currency and monies which are being circulating for illegal and terrorist activities. The government was of the view that a demonetization of large value currency notes would prevent any of these problems. Obviously, this has caused a large upheaval in the country and also certain negative influences on the economy. But the long term benefits of the demonetization move is what the government is looking to seek. Uh, just as we discussed earlier, demonetization was one of the key messages which the Indian government wanted to give to the foreign world in terms of moving away from a corruption plagued economy, moving towards a cashless economy where it is much easier to carry out business and there are much lesser hurdles in terms of the red tapes or the bureaucratical delays that at times are plagued on account of this black money problem which is there. In addition to this, it obviously also allows a unified payment system to be set up. The cost towards transacting money reduce and therefore it allows for a much more closely administered uh, business. The turnaround time for recovery of monies would be much quicker. Yet in the short term, there will be some amount of challenges which businesses would see on account of contraction of demand. Um, Digital economy, which was initially restricted to tier one uh, cities, has now been progressed to tier two and tier three cities. There have been a large number of new electronic payment gateways which have been developed. Uh, the government is pretty hopeful that the corruption which has been plaguing the country would reduce quite substantially. And also the real estate sector, which was one of the prime contributors to the black money problem in the so-called country that would be now affected and the pricing of real estate in the country would reduce quite substantially and therefore it would might make it cheaper for foreign businesses to acquire property in India and to carry out such businesses. Um, again, the number of online payment platforms which have increased is quite exponential in the last nearly 70 days since the demonetization uh, took place. There has been a shift towards organized players in the markets rather than having an unorganized sector. These are all benefits which will accrue to the economy in the long run. Uh, moving towards a few of the key case studies and just to give you an idea on what is happening and what are the key big players of the world and what are their strategies in terms of doing businesses in India. Uh, these are just some of the highlights of a large number of foreign investments which have been planned to be put into the country. PepsiCo plans to invest about US dollar 72.8 million to set up different units in, in the country to manufacture and increase its presence. The Vistra Group is acquired LFS and is looking to set up a large number of different entities in India. Ford Motor Corp has uh, committed to invest nearly 1300 crore Indian rupees to build up a global technology and business center in the country. Uh, JW Marriott has been expanding and has been one of the key players in the hotel sector in the country. Uh, Apple has uh, recently committed to set up one of its first development sectors outside the US in uh, the IT so capital of the country called Hyderabad. The government has also relaxed some of the, re the guidelines to accommodate special technology advanced sectors like Apple to encourage job growth and to promote the Make in India campaigns. There has been a large number of investment which has been flowing in from the non-resident community, which is the non-resident Indians and the persons of Indian origin. And there have been various tourism investment summits which have been held in the country, as well as the uh, summits to attract foreign investment from the Indian diaspora across the world. Uh, the Indian Department of Industry and Policy Planning Promotion, the DIPP, has allowed 100% uh, foreign direct investment in a large number of companies, including asset reconstruction companies, 
to help the issue of de declining asset quality of banks. The Indian Union Cup Cabinet has uh, allowed the permanent residency statuses to foreign investors within certain minimum investment threshold. There is again a large number of investment which the country expects to receive from the Make in India campaign, which has been promoted by the government across the world. There has been a large amount of travel being undertaken by both the prime minister of the country as well as different union ministers to give the confidence to the world that India is now at the verge of taking over as the leading economy in 2025 and will easily become one of the top three economies in the next 10 to 15 years as the government proposes to make. There have been several steps which have been discussed and taken by the government. There has been a move to ease the business into India and the regulatory frameworks which have been there. Yet we believe that there are a large number of challenges which are still there, which the government is trying to improve itself on. And the union budget on the 1st of February would be a step in that direction. Uh, lastly, we just wanted to give you a flavor of the kind of success and failure stories which have been noticed in India. It becomes essential to understand how to do business successfully in India because of the key cultural and historical backgrounds which are there in the country. And unless you have the right partner or the right understanding of how to do business in India, you might not be successful simply because of the diversity which is prevalent in India. Um, one of the key highlights which we wanted to bring about is the success story of Volvo. Uh, Volvo set up a base way back in the year 1998 and started with the measly investment. Uh, the investment has expanded quite substantially in the country and Volvo has now become one of the key luxury bus markets for them in India. Uh, what Volvo did very successfully was it sold the concept of luxury bus travel and not just as buses. It was a whole concept which was designed and sold rather than selling just the product. Uh, in India, uh, the bus length was earlier capped at 11 meters, but Volvo with its aggressive campaigning uh, got that changed. To persuade the operators, the sales team at Volvo demonstrated how Volvo buses could be more reliable and profitable. And at the end of the day, to provide a better customer experience for the Indian public, which was not used to the luxury segment. Uh, Volvo did not reach the top by cutting prices. It, it positioned itself as a luxury player in the country and it did not tone down any of its project. Rather, it developed and nurtured the market in India and then waited for it patiently for it to mature. And now the benefits of such kind of uh, long term planning is being reaped by the company in India. And uh, Volvo is clearly now a synonym for luxury bus travel in India. Uh, you do not mention that you want to travel in luxury buses. You just simply now say that you want to take a Volvo from, let's say, a New Delhi to a close by destination or from uh, Mumbai to Pune. Uh, it's received that kind of synonymity with the concept that they've been brought about. On the flip side, there have been certain stories in India which have not gone about very well. Some of the key re some of the key highlights was the, the the huge sort of failure of the Walmart story. Uh, the whole concept of Walmart, how they brought about in India, was not in the correct manner. They were trying to carry out different concepts of lobbying, which is not legally permissible in India. And as and when it was disclosed by them to the SEC and the regulatory authorities in the US, it did cause a significant amount of negative influence and eventually Walmart decided to exit the country. Similarly, IKEA, which did decide to open up and enter into India several years back, but because of various infrastructural and economic laws uh, restricting the, the entry of IKEA into India way back then, it could not enter into India. And in spite of having different concepts, which they wanted to do, they were not finally permitted by the Indian government and these discussions are still in the pipeline. So what we're trying to suggest is that a key understanding of the regulatory environment in the country is very, very essential for you to have a good flourishing business in India. 
we do appreciate that business in india can be complicated at times but it is the role of your partners in india which will give you the guidance and which will give you the assistance for understanding and appreciating the indian culture the indian diversity and how and where to position the product or the service which is being brought to india india by by the most conservative of estimates is the youngest country in the world and it has the highest per capita consumption in terms of its purchasing power the huge market which the indian demography provides cannot allow any large company to close its eyes towards entering into india yet they need to be careful and be aware of a lot of compliances and regulatory requirements which are present in india we did try and touch upon a lot of these during the course of our discussion and the last nearly 1 hour that we could provide we'd be happy to take uh, a few questions uh, during the course of this discussion um uh, uh i would suggest that either we can go ahead and type out these questions in the chat box or karen um since you're also part on this call if you suggest we could have an open dialogue i could convert the mode of the presentation to a discussion mode Okay um since I've I've just got a feedback that it might be easier to have a quick dialogue um the dialogue and the discussion mode is now open and we would be happy to have a quick dialogue for the next 10 to 15 minutes and possibly my colleagues from different parts of the world might throw some lights on what they've seen on their experiences within India and we could have quite an open dialogue on any challenges which there are prevalent in India So it's it's an open forum if if you can go ahead and uh, address any questions or Karen you might like to lead the discussion now. um whoever is speaking you might have to unmute yourself that might be there on the top left corner there would be a mic symbol you you might need to unmute yourself in case you're trying to speak uh my option would be right below the webcam in image above uh, uh on the 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 center left portion if you can see there would be a mic it would be striped off as in a cross uh whoever wants to speak might just unmute themselves
Um, Karen, I think you now have voice privileges to, to proceed. Uh, while we're waiting for any voice questions, if anyone has any other questions, if you may just type out in the chat box, please. to address your question about the most common mistake and assumption that businesses make coming into India. It's a very pertinent to address because there is a common misconception. What we normally advise the service, you need to appreciate what are the common requirements or what are the needs of the Indian consumer. If you straight away import a Western concept into the country, it might not always work. And a lot of examples, whether it is a McDonald's adapting its burgers to making it vegetarian or for that matter, a KFC vegetarian burger in India, there are a number of examples which we've come across where successful businesses have adapted themselves into Indianizing themselves and therefore they have been able to succeed rather than simply importing a western concept in the same manner into the country so i believe that would probably be the most common mistake which a large number of businesses do tend to make when they're doing and transacting with india Uh, if there are any other questions, uh, you could type out into the box as well. Okay, so I think uh, those were the broad questions which are available. Um, I once again thank you to each one of you for taking out the time to be part of this webinar. Uh, a link to this webinar will be provided by the LEA team very shortly. And we look forward to getting any questions from you on the feedback link that would be sent out to you very soon, as well as you can address those questions to us individually. I believe you do have our email addresses. Otherwise, the same would also be circulated on the group. Thank you so much and hope you have a great day ahead. Bye-bye.